Coming up this evening, live from New York City. Manufacturing activities plummet in New York, hitting a low not seen since the start of the pandemic. The Chinese regime is getting information on algorithms from its big tech firms. It's unprecedented for big tech to be sharing its key trade secrets with the government. And the summer movie season going strong. Will it fully recover to pre-pandemic levels? That and much more coming up on NTD Business. Great to have you with us. Don Mai here sitting in for Paul. We're seeing an unexpected setback for New York's manufacturing industry. The state's Federal Reserve reports the Business Conditions Index fell 42 points this month. It's the second largest decline for this tightly watched gauge of economic activity. It also leaves the index at a low not seen since the start of the pandemic two years ago. Officials say the drop is due to fewer new orders and unfulfilled orders. J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon predicted the likelihood of a downturn in the U.S. economy. He also warned that something worse than a severe recession could be on the horizon. Dimon gave the predictions in a call with clients last week. He warned that there are, quote, storm clouds on the horizon, which include rising oil prices and higher interest rates. He also gave his opinion on the chances of a soft and hard recession. He said for a soft landing, it's 10 percent, harder landing, mild recession, 20 percent, 30 percent, even harder recession, 20 percent, 30 percent, and something worse than a hard recession, same at 20 to 30 percent. And I spoke with an economic forecaster earlier, and he told me that the odds of a U.S. stock market crash could be as high as 50 percent. Here's Thomas Malinin, CEO of GNS Economics. Thomas, great to have you with us today. So in an article on the Epoch Times, you made parallels between the current environment in the U.S. to the environment prior to the stock market crash of 1929. So are you are you suggesting the late the crash in the late 20s might happen again now? It, it's, a, it's a real possibility. If you, if you think about it, it was the, the crash came after a really long boom, which was like fed by the um, Fed also, the Federal Reserve. And it was highly speculative. There's very much speculation on the stock market like there was now. And it, actually the stock market from, uh, with, from 1921 to the crash, it, it, uh, the value of Dow Jones index actually six, it, it rose about six times the starting value. And now we are somewhere near 4.8 or something like that. So we have risen in a quite similar pattern also. And the thing is that what happened in 1929 is that there was both the tightening and then the recession. And then they both appeared during the summer of 1929. And then the stock market peaked on the 3rd of September of 1929 and crashed on the 24th, 28th and 29th. So, yeah, there are rather uh, worrying similarities between the situation uh, the U.S. stock market is now and the crash of of 1929. What would you say is the likelihood of this happening or not happening? I don't know. I, I I might have to give it a 50-50 chance. Uh, it, I, 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 I know it sounds rather high, but if you just think, for example, for the there was just the the Empire uh, Manufacturing Index came in today, I think, and it was it was in a cl- quite heavy fall, which is posted on 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 August and July. So. You know, these, these uh, clear recessionary signs are building, and it seems that the stock market is not really, you know, caring about that. And inflation has really not come down so much if you look at the core inflation, for example. So the Fed will keep on tightening. And, you know, it means that the interest rates will go up. At the same time, we're heading into a recession. Now, this is exactly the same environment that caused the 1929 crash. Now, you mentioned a couple of similarities, but I like to point out there are some differences, right? Because now the stock exchange have the mechanism to suspend a trade if a stock falls too much. What do you think? Yeah, of course, there are, there are the, um, the circuit breakers there for sure. And we they were tested in the spring of 2020. And I, I don't say that the stock market will fall uh, 29% in, in, in uh, three trading days, but it may fall heavily again in, in the fall. It's, it's a real possibility. and. and uh, everyone should be uh, kind of concerned that this is a real possibility now. I'm not saying it, it will going to happen, but it may happen. 
and the similarities are rather striking. I, I, it's, they, they are like I, I make, make them quite clear in, the, in my Epoch Times article. Now, if it doesn't fall, what do you think about a severe downturn? Well, that's that's going to come in any case, and I think that we're not heading just in a recession, but a a depression. We have a we have a crisis coming, and it's going to be global. You know, it, it, there is a several a serious problem in the U.S. Uh, U.S. stock market, the financial markets, but also in the banking sector of Europe, and the euro. In a, as a currency, is, is net, it's not so stable as many think. And there are also issues with, with China. You know, it's the, the country is heavily indebted, uh, and they are, it, it's, it's clear signs that the China is also heading into a, a downturn. So there are, there are several things that point to the conclusion that we might see an, an all-out like a global economic crisis in the coming years. I see. Now, just one last thing. So whether it happens or not, it's always good to be prepared, right? So do you have any tips for us? Well, everything, there is this everything bubble going on in, our, in the world because the central banks have pushed so much this artificial liquidity into the markets through the programs, programs of quantitative easing. So I think it's just, now it's, it's physical gold and, and basically land. I wouldn't buy anything and anything else than those. All right. Thanks for your advice. Thomas Malinen, CEO of GNS Economics. Pleasure having you on today. Thanks. Nice to be here. China's central bank is bucking the global trend for rate hikes. Today, it cut key lending rates. The People's Bank of China took action after new data showed their economic recovery post-lockdown is losing steam. Retail sales grew just 2.7% in July, barely half what economists expected. Industrial output growth also fell far short of expectations. Here's a spokesman for China's National Bureau of Statistics. The domestic epidemic is spreading from various points and is frequent in many places, combined with high temperatures and rain, making it more difficult to keep the economy running smoothly. The Chinese yuan slid to one-week lows against the dollar following the data. Yet Beijing shows no sign of easing its zero COVID-19 policy. Recently, Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping vowed repeatedly to maintain the so-called zero COVID policy. The policy seeks to completely eradicate all CCP virus cases through mass testing its residents and isolating them. That's on top of stringent lockdown measures and shutting down factories. The policy differs from most other nations, which have largely adapted to living with the virus in low numbers. And China's big tech firms gave their algorithm information to the government. This is the first time ever that something like this has happened. But we don't know what's happening behind the scenes. And mind you, algorithms are a key trade secret for many tech firms, which have a lot of data on their users. And DD's Colin Fredrickson reports. China's tech giants have shared information about their precious algorithms with state regulators. The Cyberspace Administration of China is creating a registration system for those algorithms, which is completely unprecedented. The algorithms determine basically what you see in the feed, what you're interested in, Um, And it gives the tech companies an idea of what kind of content to put in front of you. Jeremy Knopf is the founder of Spartan Media. Knopf says the algorithms choose what to put in front of you based on your previous activity. Your activity becomes a lot of data, which tell a lot about you. The main prize for the Chinese Communist Party is the data. And the data that is now being made available by these companies, uh, including data, by the way, they've obtained from their American partners. Frank Gaffney is the chairman of the Committee on the Present Danger China and one of the authors of The CCP is at War with America. Gaffney says whatever the party wants, it gets. Another factor is control. The Chinese Communist Party right now has been tightening its grip on you know, on technology companies, and they've been doing it for some time. Chuck Flint is the president of Flint Consulting, a strategic communications and public policy consulting firm. Flint says other examples of the CCP wanting control is with the COVID lockdowns, bank withdrawal restrictions, and the events surrounding Jack Ma. I don't think that there's any chance of that happening other in any place other than communist China. Uh, and that is because of the power of the party. I mean, people don't realize that the party 
controls everything. Algorithms are a key trade secret of big tech firms. The algorithm information that the Cyberspace Administration of China has shown the public is very brief in general. However, we don't know how much information it has gotten from the companies behind the scenes. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. Japanese carmaker Mazda is shifting its supply chain away from China. The company has said it would ask its part suppliers to increase stockpiles in Japan and produce components outside China. This is after COVID lockdowns in Shanghai destabilized supply and hampered production. Mazda said it sent chips and crucial auto parts to China to be assembled, but didn't receive those parts from Shanghai during the city's lockdown. Now the company says they want to keep parts in their own hands. They'll work to maintain higher domestic inventories and diversify production outside China. One executive said they need to recognize that, quote, we're no longer in the era of globalization as we were in the past. And China says it's doing even more military exercises near Taiwan after another group of American lawmakers visited the island. There were five lawmakers in total, led by Democratic Senator Ed Markey. The group made an unannounced visit to Taipei on Sunday. Markey told Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen that the U.S. has a moral obligation to do everything to prevent unnecessary conflict. The Chinese military says it conducted patrols and combat drills in both the sea and airspace around the island. A Chinese general said the exercises are a, quote, solemn response to political plays by the U.S. and Taiwan that are undermining the peace and stability of the Taiwan Strait. And U.S. stocks ended higher today, adding to recent strong gains. The Dow rose 151 points or half a percent. The S&P gained 17 points or four and four tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq added 81 points or six tenths of a percent. Pfizer's CEO has tested positive for COVID-19. He received four doses of his own company's shots. Albert Borla announced the news today on Twitter. He says he's experiencing mild symptoms and is feeling well. The CEO had previously promoted the COVID-19 vaccine as being 100% effective against infection. But with newer variants, all COVID-19 vaccines have been shown to be less effective against both infection and severe illness. Pfizer, Moderna, and others are working on booster shots for the Omicron variant. Those could be rolled out in the U.S. as soon as September. Many thought that the pandemic squeeze meant the end of the movie theater outings. But the summer's movie season is wrapping up with several high-grossing films. Let's hear more from NTD's Sean Marshall. While movie ticket sales still haven't gotten back to 2019 numbers, movie executives see things changing to a positive direction. There's no question that we're coming back in relevance and in actual behavior. Martin thinks theaters need a little something extra to get back to old norms. There needs to be good incentive, you know, like like some of these movie theaters have the really nice reclining seats. Some of them are even doing like they bring food to you while you're there. You could order it on your phone, stuff like that. Yeah, you know, like they got to make it worthwhile. It has to be an experience. It can't just be like a generic walk in, buy your popcorn, sit down in the crusty seats and watch a movie, you know. <clears throat> it's really got to stand out, I feel like. So far this year, the opening weekend hauls of six movies have exceeded 91 million. And at the time of this report, popular meme stock AMC has been on the rise for the past month. I have a pretty good home theater set up at home and, and I'll usually get whatever, you know, movies that come out like the Marvel movies or the DC movies and all that stuff just watch it at home but like if something really really catches my eye and it's like really unique like a new IP and totally new movie um, then I'll go and see it in the theaters. If you're wondering whether movie theaters can have a post-pandemic comeback IMAX CEO had this to say in the company's last earnings call. Since 1980 the U.S. has seen several recessionary years and in all of those years gross box office grew Consider that for IMAX, our fastest pace of network growth ever was during the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009. Sean Marshall, NTD News. A movie which ruled the box office skies earlier this summer flew back into the top five this weekend. Here's the top five countdown. 
Jordan Peele's Nope noped out of the top three, landing in fifth place this weekend on ticket sales of $5.3 million. Thor Love and Thunder finished fourth just barely ahead of Nope with $5.31 million. Thanks to a fan appreciation event and an increased theater count, Top Gun Maverick soared back into third, up from sixth place with $7.15 million. Like a dog with its favorite chew toy, DC League of Super Pets didn't let go of second place this weekend with $7.2 million. Brad Pitt's Bullet Train did not slow down in its second weekend in theaters, holding on to first place with $13.4 million, bringing its two-week domestic total to $54.5 million. I think you might be forget and still to come, don't go away, the Illinois State Fair is underway. We take a look at some of the main attractions and hear from visitors. And a tough choice is facing pet owners in Britain as inflation soars. Some are being forced to give up their pets. Then and more coming up on NTD Business. Welcome back. Billionaire Mark Cuban is being sued. It's for his promotion of a cryptocurrency firm that ended up filing for bankruptcy. In a lawsuit filed in Florida last week, Cuban is being accused of misleading investors in promoting Voyager Digital. Defendants of the lawsuit are Voyager CEO Stephen Ehrlich and the NBA's Dallas Mavericks. The Mavericks named Voyager Digital as its official crypto brokerage last October. The Mavericks owner told the public last year that Voyager was, quote, as close to risk-free as you're going to get in the crypto universe. But despite saying this, Voyager folded in the end, resulting in $5 billion in losses to its investors. So far, Mark Cuban, the Dallas Mavericks, and Voyager Digital have not made a public comment on the legal filing. Go take a quick look in your pantry when you have time. And if you have King's Hawaiian products, they just might need to be thrown out. The company is recalling pretzel slider buns, pretzel hamburger buns, and pretzel bites. It's a voluntary decision, but the company says it just wants to be careful. After one of the ingredients was recalled by another company, if you remember Lion's Magnus, it recently had a voluntary recall too. It was after concerns that dozens of its products could potentially have bacteria in them that could make people sick. But so far, there's no reports of the products actually getting anyone sick, and King's Hawaiian hasn't found any of the concerning bacteria. But the company says throw those pretzel products out just in case. You can find more information on the FDA's website. Illinois ranks as the seventh largest state in agricultural production in the U.S., and it's currently hosting its state fair. The fair attracts hundreds of thousands of visitors annually with shows and entertainment. Here's the story. The governor of Illinois unveiled the iconic butter cow to kick off the Illinois State Fair in Springfield, Illinois last week. The 11-day fair brings fun to visitors with shows, exhibits, food, and a carnival. Dennis Schall comes from a four-generation farm family and is preparing his sheep for the livestock show. The show is a combination of uh, uh, a bodybuilding contest and a beauty pageant. So uh, got to have some muscle and expression to him, uh, but they also got to look, uh, look the part uh, with some show ring appeal and some class and, and style there as well. The livestock will compete for the championship of each category and the winners will have the opportunity to participate in the governor's sale of champions. Avery Fry will participate in the hog show and is practicing her showmanship. I practice walking them back and forth. Harness racing on the Illinois racetrack, known as one of the fastest dirt tracks in the world, thrilled visitor Keeley Folk from Morris, Illinois. Horse racing was pretty exciting to do. The food attracted Gracelyn Greenberg, the Miss Ford County Fair Queen, she says tasting food is her favorite activity, 
besides competing for Miss Illinois County Fair Queen. There's so many different things to try and getting to try different things from every stand is always such a fun time. The carnival offers rides and games with prizes. Luke Hall, a local resident, enjoyed the rides. The Ring of Fire, that's one. It, you go upside down in a ring. It's really fun. Brody Newhoff, also a local resident, is visiting the fair for the first time with a group of friends. I just won this lion. I shot a basketball like Kobe Bryant, my favorite player. The Illinois State Fair also features Conservation World, exhibit that teaches about nature and live performances such as Jetpack Flying Water Circus and much more. The fair runs through Sunday. Reporting by Angela Moy, NTD News, Springfield, Illinois. Using 5,000 boxes of cereal gifted by Kellogg's, members of Chicago Children United for Ukraine have created a Guinness World Record-breaking cereal mosaic. The proceeds are going to help nonprofit group Razom for Ukraine. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the report. Last Thursday, these teenagers in Chicago used corn pops and Rice Krispies for a worthy cause. With the corn pops yellow boxes and the Rice Krispies blue ones, the teens made a massive Ukrainian flag on the floor of the Wind Trust Financial Corporation's Grand Banking Hall in downtown Chicago. You're looking at the Ukrainian flag made out of approximately 5,000 cereal boxes, and the previous record was 4,000, so we, we broke it by a big amount. Ryder Schiffman of Chicago Children United for Ukraine explained how they came up with the idea. We came up with this idea because originally Michael and I, like, we were like, we, every time we like came down or something like that, we always ate cereal. And we love cereal so much. So we decided we were like, oh, let's like use cereal as the perfect food to create the mosaic of the cereal box mosaic. Schiffman explained the meaning behind the colors. The corn pops represent the fields for the bottom of the flag and the Rice Krispies represent the sky in the, for the Ukraine flag. The teens aren't just providing financial support for Ukraine, but also for their local community as well. It's amazing to like help the people in Ukraine and also help people in Chicago get like food from the Greater Chicago Food Repository. As of Monday morning, donors have given nearly $25,000 to the group's Cereal Mosaic fundraiser to help Ukraine. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Pet owners in the UK are giving up their pets to save money. They're making this tough choice amid the tightest squeeze on living standards since the 1960s. Here's the story. Meet Harriet, the English Cocker Spaniel. She was found running along a busy road in London after witnesses say she was pushed out of a car abandoned. And she's a possible victim of the worsening cost of living crisis that a leading animal charity says has led to a growing number of people to part with their pets. Harriet's now one of hundreds of dogs and cats currently being looked after by England's famous Battersea charity. And similar centres around the country say they're seeing record inquiries for dog and cat returns. The tightest squeeze on living standards since at least the 1960s is forcing many owners to decide the additional cost of food and vet bills isn't manageable. Steve Craddock is the centre manager. We are seeing an increase of the animals that people want to gift into Battersea of up to 30% from last year. Whilst we don't have any specific data, we are seeing that some of these animals are because people are no longer able to look after them. They're no longer able to afford their care, particularly things like veterinary care. One particular case is Magpie. There's a cat that's come into Battersea Dogs and Cats Home just this week. Uh, Magpie has been brought in by its owner because uh, has become pregnant and the owner is no longer able to afford to care for Magpie or her kittens once they're born. The trend follows a surge in demand for pets during the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown. It also comes amid warnings of recession and as UK households are dealing with a massive crisis in their energy bills. They're set to triple in January and some charities have warned it could put millions of people into poverty. Dogs Trust currently has 692 dogs needing homes in centres across the country. It said the last time it had seen anything like this was in the wake of the 2008 financial crash. For now, it means plenty of fluffy faces are just hoping someone can give them a permanent home. And that's the latest from the NTD business team and myself, Don Ma. You can follow me on Twitter too. If you have any news tips or feedback, you can email us at business at ntd.com. 
That's all for today. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.